come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's build a giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. The butterflies in springtime will lead us on our way. Exploding dandelions will brighten summer's day. And if our dream's a good one, and if our dream is right, then imagination can be real if we will dream to. The American physician Lewis Thomas once wrote that alchemy began long ago as an expression of the deepest and oldest of human wishes to discover that the world makes sense. For Ken and his colleagues, alchemy meant the modern art of turning dreams into reality. To accomplish this, we must first turn our dreams into actual goals and then carefully describe the steps required to accomplish those goals. We must also realize that whatever we accomplish will be because we have worked together as a family of talented people who share the same goals. Accordingly, we want all of our company members to feel that they are personally contributing to the overall success of our company. We were still doing other projects, but once Teddy hit, we became, I think, what Ken avoid, <laughs> wanted to avoid us becoming, and we became corporate. He wanted to create an HR department, so I went into HR. All of a sudden, I'm working with LA attorneys, writing a policy procedure manual, which we called the Member's Handbook, because we still didn't want employees, we wanted members. The organizational structure of Alchemy 2 has evolved into something different than most other companies. Rather than a pyramid, the structure of Alchemy 2 is circular, with a product or project in the center as the focal point. The outer ring around the product is made up of each of the departments responsible for making that product successful. Ken could walk in the front door and he could get anything made. We didn't have to go anyplace else. We were totally capable of doing whatever was required within the walls of our company. And many people who came to see us and saw the company and saw what we were doing likened us to Disney in the very early days when Walt was forming the company and he was focused entirely on the creativity of it. There were no less than 21 departments making up Alchemy 2. They are listed in the member's handbook along with accompanying descriptions. Engineering, design and specifications for product, housings, mechanical, electrical and audio systems, delineation of prototype and production techniques, continuity and quality control. Art, concept art, production design, art, direction, graphics, book packaging and licensing illustration, character and product design, interior design, paste up and photography, electronics, design and production of control systems for motion, sound and lighting, circuit and system design, interactive control technologies, programming systems, special audio and visual effects, sculpture, character maquettes, mock-ups and finished sculpture for small-scale, full-sized or large-scale figures, body subforms or components, patterns for product prototypes, plastics, original tooling, casting and lamination of plastics, vacuum forming, injection molding, research of materials and techniques, purchasing, research and acquisition of supplies and materials, maintenance of on-hand supply inventory and catalog library, shipping and receiving, fabrication, design, pattern making and construction of soft bodied characters for toys, puppets, animation and walk around costumes, coverings of fur fabrics, feathers, and wigs, design and fabrication of clothing, mechanics, construction and assembly of mechanical systems, including armatures, motors, servos, cylinders, linkages, etc. 
tooling of models for prototypes and production, model building, construction of scale models, miniatures and mock-ups, props, patterns and models for prototype or production tooling, construction, carpentry and related construction of stages, sets, scenery, etc., building improvements, shipping containers, scenics and cosmetics, painting and finishing of maquettes, models, miniatures, mock-ups, props, prototypes, stages, sets and scenery, figure makeup, etc., show production, talent auditioning and casting, performance of music, lyrics, and dialogue for recording of software, soundtracks, records, tapes, etc., maintenance of recording facilities, animation and effects programming, tape duplication, maintenance of tape and film library, project installation, coordination of shipping and on-site installation, maintenance and repair under warranty and contract, creation of service manuals, assistance with quality control, shop maintenance, alteration, repair, and service of buildings, offices, and work areas, personnel, managing of company personnel policies, compensation, benefits, programs, medical insurance, member relations, maintenance of personnel records, establishing of programs for career enhancement, supplemental benefits, and recreation, marketing, soliciting and initiating of company business, evaluation of potential products or projects, management of advertising and public relations, legal, business negotiations, documentation, contracts, copyrights, trademarks, patent application, title search, and corporate records, accounting, payroll, accounts payable, accounts receivable, departmental and project budget preparation, cash flow and financial projections, taxes, documentation and long-range financial planning, communications, administrative assistance, reception, telecommunications, documentation procedures, typing, photocopying, maintenance of company files, maintenance of office equipment, mailing and travel arrangements, project coordination, coordination between departments for the purpose of scheduling, budgeting, documenting and expediting of specific projects, assistance to departments in evaluating talent pool and personnel requirements. The 21st department, simply called Concepts, was responsible for product ideas and descriptions, story ideas and adaptations, scripts for software, video, film, and everything else that might be related, in addition to music composition and lyrics, and research and maintenance of the Alchemy 2 company library. I loved the concepts department. I just loved it. There were very interesting people up there. I had kind of gotten funneled into administration and some of the hard, nasty business stuff. And every once in a while, I would go up and go into the concepts room and say hi to everybody. And one day I walked in and they were all sitting in a circle on the rug. And I went over and sat down and they said, come join us by the campfire. They had created a campfire all out of paper, the flames, the logs, everything. And they were sitting around the campfire brainstorming. And I remember thinking, oh, I want to be here. I don't want to be downstairs dealing with business. I want to sit by the campfire with you. Working at Alchemy was like being with your family every day. In fact, it was more fun than a family. And there was so many great creative people and so many interesting people that walked through the door. And I attribute that work environment to Ken because he was the patriarch. You rarely find places like that to work. It's because it was a company that was formed by an artist. He hired artists and technicians in the beginning. He was always a little suspicious of the business people. All those parts of business that an artist doesn't want to deal with. And ideally, if Ken had been more business-minded, we would not have had all those departments because he would have been stashing money away or thinking of selling the company or planning to go public or whatever it is that happens normally. But I think for Ken that it was a dream come true. Ken Forsey and Don Kingsborough may have sported very different personalities, but both understood the importance of keeping up a sense of camaraderie in their respective workplaces. When Worlds of Wonder went public, Don threw a huge party in Fremont, complete with a dunk tank, which he happily took part in, as well as a pie-throwing booth where he offered himself up to any and all, resulting in a champagne and whipped cream melee, leaving no one unscathed.
Meanwhile, down in Southern California, Ken remembered well the impersonal nature that a company could have, especially one expanding at the rate that his was. And so he made sure his alchemists knew that while the work should be done in a reasonable amount of time, fun should also factor into their regular routines. In the 1980s, birthdays were celebrated at Alchemy because of Linda Pearson. She made events at Alchemy and she made them fun. And Linda, early on, found this hard hat. And if it was your birthday, you had to put on the hard hat and get a picture made. And as time went on, she kept adding things and adding things and adding things to that damn hard hat. To the point that we called it the hat of shame and people would go, oh, no, 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 I don't have to wear it. She'd say, yes, you do. Whenever it was your birthday, you had to wear the hat while you were blowing out the candles so you could have your mandatory Polaroid picture taken and recorded of your birthday. And when we moved to facilities where people actually had offices instead of being in one room, then there, of course, their office was like, oh my God, all bets are off. What's going to happen to your office during a birthday? Because it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Yes, my birthday day has rolled around. A mere infant, Worlds of Wonder sold 800,000 Teddy Ruck spins by Christmas and has already sold 200,000 this year. By the end of its fiscal year on March 31st, it expects to post sales of more than $100 million for Teddy Ruxpin, two accessory dolls, clothing, books, and tapes. With seven weeks left to go, the firm is closing in on the record for first year sales set by Compaq Computer Corp of Houston, the portable computer maker that posted sales of $111 million in 1983. We have a real good shot at beating that, said Don Kingsborough, the company's chairman, president, and chief executive. Jonathan Greer, the Tallahassee Democrat, February 11th, 1986. So every year at Toy Fair, all the buyers from different companies would go and see the wares of different companies and determine what they were going to purchase for the next year. But World of Wonder started too late and couldn't get a spot in that building. So they rented the St. Moritz Hotel and we made our own space in one of the conference rooms with Teddy and Grubby and all our future products. They brought in all the buyers from the different companies to see what we had. And they rented six limousines for the entire time so they could shuttle people back and forth between the toy building and our location. We were a little isolated because it was Worlds of Wonder that was the front company. Worlds of Wonder did all the marketing. Worlds of Wonder did all the PR. And they did a fabulous job. They really did. And Alchemy had creative control of every single thing that happened with Teddy, from the technology to the toy to all the line extension, all the other characters. And if you look at the entire world of Teddy Ruxpin, you will see that we were working on continuity. We were working on authenticity. We were working creatively to keep that product as perfect as we could. Parents who are pestered for a Teddy Ruxpin animated bear can look forward to being importuned for an animated Mickey Mouse or Snoopy in coming months. Worlds of Wonder has announced that it has entered into multi-year exclusive licensing agreements with the Walt Disney Company and a similar agreement with United Feature Syndicate to produce Peanuts characters. The first offspring of these partnerships should be in stores this fall. Kim Masters, The Los Angeles Daily News. So Larry <laughs> was a um, MG car fanatic. So we all had gone out to lunch one day, or at least Larry and me and a couple other people, and we came back, and there's this MG there. And I said, oh my God, Larry, you got another one? And he said, oh yeah. I open the door, I go to sit in it. No, no, I, it's not mine. I was kidding, it's not mine. It's like, oh my God, thanks a lot. And I get out and then look at the back of it, and there's a plywood disc and it has Snoopy in a spacesuit on the moon. And he said, that's Charles Schultz's car. Charlie, old basketball head, as we used to call him. You know, how do you make a mouth open and close when you're a giant sphere? And Snoopy's got a snout that's like, you know, eight inches long. So we had to have some serious torque to get that mouth to open and close. <laughs> that's the round-headed kid singing. You know, the one who feeds me. Snoopy, you can talk after all these years? Now you can tell me a story.
look, after Teddy, this was second tier stuff at that point. We had to collect it all and do it so other companies couldn't do it. And I wasn't too happy about all these things being thrown on our plate when we had bigger fish to fry, but we got them done reasonably well. When a toy company set out to animate its Snoopy doll, it called on none other than the Peanuts creator himself, Charles Schultz. After all, how else do you bring words to the mouth of Joe Cool Beagle? who has been silent for 35 years. In addition to selecting Snoopy's voice, Schulz assisted the toy manufacturer in developing the product line true to the character of the famous Beagle, the Montgomery Advertiser. There was one marketing product manager who got to go to meet with Charles Schultz and show him the prototypes and show him what the product was doing. And it was just so exciting to know that she was going right to his house. She was so thrilled. The world of Snoopy only ever saw the release of the talking beagle himself, voiced by Cam Clark and his pal Woodstock as a hand puppet that could chirp. Charlie Brown, unfortunately, never went past the prototype stage, despite Alchemy 2's best efforts to help Worlds of Wonder make him look and operate the way they had hoped. The Talking Mickey Mouse show would debut with the titular mouse and eventually welcome Goofy, the latter having been done by Alchemy 2. But plans for further talkers, like Donald Duck, never went beyond the initial planning phase. For Ken, these types of projects, where Alchemy 2 helped out Worlds of Wonder, represented additional income for his company. Teddy Ruxpin continued generating huge sales numbers across the country and with foreign language releases around the world. While he enjoyed exploring the land of Grundo, Ken also felt there should be other stories, timeless ones he had read growing up, shared with the new generation of children, and presented in a way only Alchemy 2 could deliver. For centuries, parents around the world have shared the timeless magic of Mother Goose stories and fairy tales with their children. And despite their quaint language and traditional themes, the stories, which have been passed down from generation to generation, have never lost their charm. But this year, the traditional storyteller, Mother Goose herself, will take a dramatic step into the future of children's imaginations and fantasies when she literally comes to life through a patented animation technology. The Palm Beach Post, December 12, 1986. Ken was determined to bring renewed life into stories from the likes of the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen. Originally, the talking toy pegged for this purpose was an old man simply called Storyteller, based on a piece Alchemy 2 had previously worked on called The Mariner. But Ken's better judgment prevailed, and Mother Goose was announced in the actual form of a talking fowl. I just remember him calling me in and saying there was this new toy and he asked if I would write the stories and I was floored. Stories, fairy tales, all that had been my life for so long to have this opportunity was just incredible. The toughest part for that one was the fur fabric so that her head could move. Many of these things have a plastic part that the fur attaches to. Valerie Edwards and I worked very closely together and one of the things, which is a kind of a secret, but we developed working together a way that she could carve away where the seams would be so that you didn't see the seams on the outside. What goes into sculpting? Well, it depends on the thing. It depends on how evolved it is at the time and where they want to go with it because sometimes there's a lot of art on something so you can look at all the different views and angles and stuff but sometimes you just get a little sketch and sometimes you don't get anything at all so it really depends on the item. Each item is different so it's just a matter of seeing it from all angles I guess. Mother Goose was a bit of a challenge, but also exciting. All the people that worked on it in the figure finish group were so excited about it. Even my fabric brother, somebody who would go out and look for samples of fabric, she was invested in the character and fulfilling that part of finding the right things for her bonnet and her little outfit. The prototype was amazing. The head turned, the eye blink, the beak open and closed, her head would turn side to side, and the prototype allowed her to move her head up and down. So she could do a diagonal movement with her head that made her look so amazingly real. With somebody like Ken, you had so much story behind it. You had so much vision already. It becomes like reading a book. You see it in your head and you understand its character and you try to get behind it in that way. You try to get into that character. You try to understand what it is and how that character feels to make it come alive. I did most of the writing for 
from Mother Goose at home. Lots of times I would think of lyrics in the car driving between Chatsworth and North Hollywood and I kept a tape recorder in the car and I would just let it run. I don't remember how many days I would have to write the stories, but I would write them at home, bring them into work, type them up at work, and then shoot them over to Ken. And as I recall, it was overnight that Ken would kick it back to me. He, I would walk in the morning, he'd give me a big smile and he'd hand me the script that I had typed and with his notes on it and lots of times his additions to the lyrics and everything. And then from that, I would take that and add his comments. And then we would have a staff meeting with Mary and Larry Larson and do a read. And Mary would play Mother Goose and Larry loved to do voices. So Larry would pick up the other voices and we would go through the script together. And everybody had such a fabulous time getting into the stories that I would just write like crazy, adding in new dialogue, adding in where, where things worked. And then I would do a final of that for Ken's final approval, and then it went to recording. I'm Mother Goose. How are you, dear? Hi. I have so many wonderful stories to tell you. One of my favorites is about a distant cousin of mine. It's called the Ugly Duckling. <laughs> now, as I'm telling the story, you can follow along in the book. Whenever you hear me honk like this, <laughs> that's the signal for you to turn the page. All right? Mother Goose sold well enough upon its release to warrant the addition of a second talker to the brand. Mary Becker suggested the new toy be Hector, the ugly duckling of the pack-in storybook and cassette that came with Mother Goose. Like the talking grubby was to Teddy, Hector would be fully dedicated to Mother Goose in order to operate. Unlike Grubby, however, Hector got his own line of storybooks focused on nursery rhymes. And it was at that point that I was brought in to take on the Mother Goose and Hector series worked with Margaret a bit about that, and then I was off on my own. Both she and Ken really wanted to see what I could do with it. And I called Lucy Taylor, who was the original voice of Leota, and is, of course, Minnie Mouse also. And I said, I want to do something different. What I want to do is develop the relationship between Mother Goose and Hector, and of course, she was also Mother Goose. And what does Hector mean to Mother Goose? What does Mother Goose mean to Hector? So they would have a really loving relationship. The fact that he calls her Mommy Goose and not Mother Goose, that came out in these improvs we were doing together. That was a wonderful way to work. And it's my understanding that Rusi sometimes could do the Mother Goose voice and then switch immediately to Hector without having to go into an editing room and piece the voices together or record the voices separately. She could do it right on the spot. You know how much money that saves? But the voices were so sincere. A nursery rhyme, a nursery rhyme. I'll tell you a story, it won't take much time. A nursery rhyme, a nursery rhyme. And you will remember it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea that they were bringing these stories to life, especially Peter and the Wolf and so many of the other little fairy tales. I just thought it was great. Doing multiple voices, doing Peter, being in that consciousness, working with outstanding people and with outstanding music. I just thought it was wonderful. You've never heard Peter and the Wolf with characters doing lines and everything. When we did Peter and the Wolf, I used a string quartet, French horn, tuba, a small little chamber group. Just then, three hunters came out of the woods. That old wolf had caused a lot of trouble in other places, and they were out to find him, following his trail that led to the meadow. Suddenly, they saw the wolf. They were surprised to see him hanging by his tail, and there in the tree sat a very happy Alexis and Misha and Peter. We've caught the wolf! See? Well, what shall we do with him? Peter suggested they take the wolf to the zoo. He couldn't get into trouble there. <laughs> You know, it was like being in a creative world. And I was working with Rusi, who is a dream. It's kind of hard to explain something like that. You just feel very much in the moment. And it's very exciting. But you are not you. You are what you are portraying. I laughed at Hector. He didn't look exactly like the other baby ducks. Hector looked down at his reflection in the water when he saw himself in the pond with its surrounding banks. He didn't see an ugly duckling Hear stand. everybody's favorite fairy tale. He saw a beautiful From everybody's favorite storyteller. Soft white feathers 
the talking mother goose Blender from Blender. worlds of wonder. So they lived happily ever after. With every new show that came in, it was like Christmas morning for me. I would sit there at the end of the day and play it back. And sometimes it was so beautiful, I literally would tear up. The stories of the Mother Goose were just very unique. One of the aspects that really gave them a unique flair was George Wilkins' music. And he used a lot of instruments of that period to make that sound authentic. For instance, for the Sleeping Beauty, there was a lot of acoustic guitar and mandolin. Sweet girl of 16, you have brightened the sunlight. You've made every day bright with your lovely smile. Sweet girl of 16, how did that tiny baby Come, a young lady, in such a short while. The other story that comes to mind that was so unique audibly was the Little Red Riding Hood because they made the wolf a bit dastardly kind of character, you know, the kind that has the cape that puts over his face as he walks through the land, sneaking in. He did this with a saloon piano and a string quartet. And it gave the story such an incredible backing. It carried the story all the way through. You can trust me to be mean. He's a little down, he's dirty. I can turn a happy scene into a dark and sad affair. If the setting is serene, look around you and beware. You can bet that my routine will put you into deep despair. Oh. <laughs> What an awful wolf. Thank you. As far as I'm concerned, I think Mother Goose is one of the best toys from what I've done in my life musically. The Mother Goose stuff was really good. The way that those stories worked out and the acoustic guitar underscore and the songs were really well done. It's a shame that that toy kind of didn't get the same traction that Teddy Ruxpin did. Because of Ken's heart, each of these stories is a slight variation of the original stories. There was to be no violence in these stories at all. In Hansel and Gretel, for example, the witch was not pushed into the oven. She she was a bit blind and so kind of tripped and did it on her own. The giant in Jack and the Beanstalk didn't fall to his death. He climbed back up the stock. The wolf in Little Red Riding Hood didn't gobble up the grandmother. He shoved her into a closet. But because it was done with such heart and there was always a message that went along with these stories at the end that it was so kin. We see ourselves in one sense as a storytelling company and Mother Goose is the quintessential storyteller. So once our Teddy Ruxpin proved that animated talking plush toys would be popular, the talking mother goose was a natural addition to our product line. She is more than a tape player. She is a lifelike storyteller who talks to her friends. And if the child grabs her mouth or neck or pokes her eyes, temporarily stopping movement, the program tape will automatically resynchronize the moving parts once they're freed and no damage is done. With the increase in two income households, parents are busier than ever but they want to pass along to their children the traditional fairy tales they heard as children, even if they can't read to them every day. Our animated Mother Goose allows parents of the 1980s to share these classic stories with their children in a new, unique way. Don Kingsborough. Ken was a visionary in a lot of ways. He understood the power of story, and I think he also understood the power of a child's intelligence. He kind of approached everything with kind of an education of the spirit. Everything about goodness, kindness, responsibility, respect, all exude out of all of these stories. Nestled among a cluster of houses on a quiet Ottawa side street, Atkinson Film Arts produces animation programs that have won international acclaim. Inside the large brick building, the air is bristling with activity as some 170 animators, artists, and editors are now at work breathing life into Teddy Ruxpin, star of the most ambitious animation television series ever produced in Canada, The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin. Lorena Bacar, Cinema Canada. After it was deemed too expensive to create a television series in the same vein as the live action special, Alchemy 2 signed a deal with Deke Enterprises for a 65 episode animated series to be distributed by LBS Communications. Canada would host the production due to a low exchange rate and tax incentives. 
The Ottawa-based Atkinson Film Arts served as base of operations where primary design, storyboarding, and recording would take place. The animation itself would be done across the Pacific and East Asia. The first five half hours came back and it was the worst animation I'd ever seen in my life. And I looked at Andy Hayward, who's president of the company, and said, Andy, there is no way this thing's ever going to make air. I sat down with Ken. I closed the door and said, Ken, I'm going to show you something. So I ran it and I could see he was really disappointed. I said, there's no way I'm going to allow you to put your name on it. And I got a hunch before I left to go back to show the footage to Ken, they knew in their hearts this thing was dreadful and they swapped animation studios in Asia. One of our primary objectives was to create stories that children could watch with their parents, parents could watch with their children. And hopefully there'd be some connection between them, something that would be, gee, mom or gee, dad, what does this mean? What's going to happen next? Or why is he doing that? It would actually create interaction. And that way, kind of help build the family as opposed to just being kind of passive entertainment. To meet that end, it was agreed that Canadian writers would handle the actual pending of scripts, while Ken would provide them with outlines and maintain overall creative control in order to ensure his high standards. To make all this happen, Ken needed to share the workload. That was when I went to Ken and I said, could I submit some ideas? And Ken said, sure, they would welcome that. So I think I came up with about 20 episode ideas and showed it to Ken and Larry and we sat in Ken's office and we went through the list. Ken was saying, oh yeah, I like that. That would be fun. Oh, okay, yeah, that sounds like a good one. Soon thereafter, Ken said, the series needs something written up about the show. Why don't we have you take a crack at it? Why don't you start writing the proposal for the new show? Before full outlines could be sent to Atkinson, Ken wanted to put together a Teddy Ruxpin Universe Bible in order to maintain continuity across all potential platforms. This was Ken's opportunity to show that not only had he created a solid narrative for Teddy, he had developed a rich backstory to the whole of his fantasy world. The ancient species of northern Rux had long hair of a tawny color. Its cousin to the south, the bear, had short brown hair. When the northern Rux migrated south, they co-mingled with the bear. A new species was formed. These creatures had a soft brown fur with a red hue and became known as Iliops. The Iliops are actually the proto-species of what becomes the land of Grundo. As the very ancient ones spread out across the continent, they evolve based on the different environments. This gives us the Illipers, of which Aaron and Arusia are, Perluns, which is what Gimmick is, and the Grunges. Countless generations ago, something happened in the region of Grundo that would drastically change the normal development of the area and its inhabitants. In that early dawn, a hot molten form burst through the atmosphere and landed in a rocky area northeast of what is now the hard to find city. The meteorite fused with the rocks around it and slowly buried itself in the ground. Exactly what that object was is not yet clear, but the effect it had on Grundo still remains. This object amplified the already existing traits of the different species throughout the continent. Iliops became kinder and wiser, while creatures like the trolls and Gatangs became sneakier and nastier. The Iliops construct a wall spanning east to west, which cuts what we call Grundo off from the northern country that ends up bearing the name of Ying. The Heart to Find City is built to maintain a constant vigil. So, for many generations, the Iliops pursue their peaceful endeavors, learning more and more all the time. Their science became very advanced. Some of their greatest accomplishments were embodied in the tiny crystals, which became almost mystical. Eventually, the Gatangs and their flying machines invade, forcing the Iliops to abandon their home and flee for their lives. Theodore, one of the Iliop leaders, breaks off half of the medallion key and takes it with him so no one can access the power of the crystals, which range from being able to shrink or grow things to creating oxygen within a vacuum. The Iliops found refuge in the southern continent of Rolonia, and Theodore drew a map in order to remember the way back to the hard-to-find city so that he could one day reclaim his people's homeland. Both the medallion half and map would be passed down through his family, eventually falling into myth due to the Iliops being farther away from the meteorite. What seemed to be indifference was, in reality, a loss of the artificial ambition that had been imposed on the Iliops. That is why the marvelous quest was so easily forgotten. Until generations later, when a mother Iliop sings a quiet lullaby to her tiny son. A lullaby that tells of far-off places and treasure bright. A lullaby that sparks a desire that has not existed for countless generations when the tiny Iliop's ancestors held a part of a broken medallion and looked to the north. To create antagonists who went beyond the Gatangs, Ken dusted off the idea for the entity that Tweeg desperately wanted to be a member of, renaming it the Monsters and Villains Organization, or MAVO for short. 
and its leader, carrying the title of Supreme Oppressor, was designed to be the embodiment of evil. Monsters and villains! We have in our possession something that will be of great significance to Marvel. Deep inside, Queller is actually a rotten, cold-hearted son of a troll. His motto is, when walking through the Garden of Life, don't forget to stop and kill the roses. He will prove to be a formidable and brutal adversary. However, for the time being, Queller just rests on his evil laurels, goofing off and playing with his pet slugs. He completely underestimates Teddy, Grubby, Gimmick, and their allies as opponents. However, after Mavo has been outsmarted by Teddy and his friends a few times, Queller begins to take them seriously. The Supreme Oppressor is made aware of an ancient prophecy via the equally ancient-looking Understander of Legends. If an Iliop should ever possess all of the crystals, evil itself would be wiped from Grundo forever. But if Mavo were to gain them, darkness would fall across the land and all goodwill would be vanquished. But Ken needs a plot device in place because Teddy comes into possession of the six crystals in the first story arc, which become the first five episodes. So he actually brings back the idea that there were seven pieces to the treasure of Grundo. The seventh crystal is in Queller's possession and rests inside the black box, able to erase and restore a person's memory. It becomes an important part of the plot later on in the series and a source of humor because whoever possesses it, like physically holding the black box, is seen as the supreme oppressor. Well, what are you waiting for? Well, I... it's just that I can't, uh, can't... Can't what? Seize him, I say! Duty requires I say it! Article 17, paragraph 31 of the Marvel Bylaws clearly states that the supreme oppressor shall have possession of the black box at all times. Therefore, you, Tweed, must be the new supreme oppressor! Being mindful of the maps of Middle Earth in the works of Tolkien, Ken understood the importance of not only his alchemists knowing the layout of his imagined world, but the fans as well. To accomplish this, he commissioned Dave High to create a canonical map of the land of Grundo. The area of Grundo pictured on this map is about the size of Wyoming. It would take Teddy, Grubby, and Gimmick at least two weeks to walk from Gimmick's house to King Nogbert's palace, depending on the weather, their pace, and the duration of picnics and visits en route. But with the airship, it only takes them four or five days. Two days if they're just going to the Great Desert. It's actually Trembly Fault, which spans the length of Grundo, that keeps foot traffic impeded. All of the ancient bridges the Iliops built have fallen into ruin by the time Teddy arrives, so everyone is sort of isolated. In light of the Great Wall of Ying and Trembly Fault, the airship was a major breakthrough indeed. Before the invention of the airship, no one but wood sprites, bird people, Gatangs, and Louie really had freedom of movement. Now that Teddy, Grubby, and Gimmick can go anywhere they want to, the power equation has changed in Grundo. Those at Mavo realize this, and they are sincerely displeased. With the general backstory and history in place, Ken and his writers were able to draft episode lists with brief summaries. Originally, the plan was to simply put the adventure series storybooks in chronological order. It quickly became apparent that this would not do. While storylines from the talking toy property would appear, Ken knew he wanted a cohesive narrative. To that end, he mapped out the idea that there would be 65 episodes broken down into 13 sets of five story arcs. We worked very closely with Ken on this. So the idea was that we would have a show that would have a story every day, a story every week, and then one story that was 65 episodes long. Because Ken's world was so deep and rich, we had a lot of characters to work with. You know, story is character. So we had wonderful characters that if you put them together and you really deeply understood who they were, then they would just create the story for you in a sense. And Ken knew that. It was a joy getting to write with Ken, just tossing out ideas and having him toss out ideas. And sometimes we'd be stumped about what to do with stories and we'd go around and around trying to find an answer. I remember in one episode where we find out there's a cave above Rainbow Falls that the river goes through that leads to the falls. 
And so we got this idea that it would be fun to end the episode with some Jeopardy where the hole leading out of the cave would get plugged up. Then the cave would fill with water and Grubby and Teddy would have to find their way out before the cave filled with water and they died. We were going round and round about how to plug the hole and how are we going to get enough rocks there to plug the hole and why would they be putting the rocks there and what happens that moves the rocks there. We had all kinds of involved scenarios. And then Ken stopped and said, oh, wait, I know. Willie just slips and he falls down and his butt plugs up the hole and so they can't get out. And I remember him saying at that meeting, if you look for it long enough, there's always a simple answer in this story. The more involved you get, usually the more off track you are. And you have to look for the simple detail, which will lead you to the next part of the story. Ken, Len, and Phil would work together to write five separate outlines at a time all linked by a single story arc within the larger context of the main narrative across the planned 65 episodes. These roughly four to five page documents would be sent to Canada for Atkinson's people to turn into scripts. Ken and his team would still get the last look before anything was finalized. With this going on, the artist could convene in Ottawa and get to work. When we worked on the raccoons, we were responsible for the episodes from the get-go. When Teddy Ruxpin came along, this was new to us that it came almost like a new Teddy Ruxpin toy right out of the box. They said, here it is, here's the whole story down to the fine detail. All you guys have to do is bash it out in a succession of scenes. So on one hand, it kind of saves you a lot of work. But on the other hand, you know, the struggle, the uphill struggle as a writer, is you understand that the guys who gave that to you had a very, very clear vision of what they wanted, and you had to do justice to it. I found the atmosphere at Atkinson to be a lot of fun, but it was an awful lot of work too. A lot of pressure, time constraints. We really had a lot of work that we had to put out and I was really excited that I was able to keep up with the work. We had a lot of fun people and the things I remember were the fun times. The the hard times, there were certainly lots of them, but those memories don't seem to linger as well as the good times, the fun times. So we started ramping up to do Teddy and we ended up with about 200 people working on staff in the studio. Everything was done by hand, right? So it's all original art, beautiful original art. And what you end up with is piles and piles and piles of thousands and thousands of drawings and cells and hundreds and hundreds of beautiful watercolored backgrounds. Tweed Gets the Tweezels was the episode that me and my writing partner at the time were involved in. And I think because of our reputation as humorists, they picked one of the lighter shows, one of the shows that wasn't so big arc heavy, but that was going to provide a kind of a comic relief circumstance. L.B. called me a doctor! Okay, Twib, you're a doctor. Somebody said, what the heck? These guys are trying to flog these old, tired vaudeville jokes. Call me a doctor. Are you nuts? That ultimately got us fired, which is why we only worked on a single episode. My favorite characters to draw were Grubby and LB. Grubby because of the very expressive face that Grubby had, and plus he was all circles. The six legs were hard to draw, but the body shape was very easy. LB also was a very fun character to draw. He had a very expressive face, and the shape, of course, the pear shape, and the little dinosaur-type legs that he had. The understander of legends was the character I found most difficult to draw, and the reason for that was the very unusual shape shape of the understander and the many lines in the design and it was very difficult. I spent a lot of time trying to keep the proportions and the facial structure together and to make it look right and just seemed to be a bit of a struggle for me but I got through that. With the writing, storyboarding and drawing going on, the voiceover talent needed to be assembled. There was early talk of the entire cast being local Canadian talent but Ken was adamant that at the very least Teddy, Grubby, and Gimmick remain the same. While Phil Barron and Will Ryan would make the regular trips north, Tony Pope elected not to join them. In his place for the animated series, Newton Gimmick received a new voice. You tell your boss that I accept his challenge. And tell him to pack his bags. Oh, whatever you say, Limerick. That's a gimmick. 
Newton a gimmick. I don't think gimmick was really a stutterer. He was just laden with hesitation. It wasn't a stutter. When he talked, it would be well, Teddy. I didn't consider that a stutter. He was just muddled. I think that's probably the best word for it. Gimmick had probably so many thoughts going on in his head, and he was going in 16 directions at the same time. And in order to sort of focus on exactly what he wanted to say, he subconsciously ran through all the options. And I think that's why he was kind of all over the place. When it came time for me to read for LB right at the very beginning, we talked about not trying to match the vocal quality from the sample that I was given. There was a kind of a New Yorkish undertone to what I was hearing in the sample. You know, I came up with this idea that he was a kind of a grumpy, self-assured New York cab driver. I didn't know that he had no arms at that point. They didn't show me a drawing of him until afterwards when I went for a callback. I saw he had a horn and a big mouth. So I thought, well, I'm going to use a lot of wide mouth vocalization and try to get him a little deep, but not too deep. And I got him raspy. Maybe in another incarnation, this guy smoked a lot. The most difficult voice I've ever done, and I just absolutely adored doing, was Eleanor Tweeg because it was really hard on my throat. We had a kind of a joke going on in Ottawa at the time. There was a union rep who had come from England. She was quite sarcastic. And so everyone in town would mimic her. And I got quite good at it. And I said, I think it would be really fun if I did her, but then just add that element in Eleanor's voice that sounds like she drank Sterno. She was meant to be so ridiculously over the top that you could almost laugh at her. It's probably one of those door-to-door salesmen. Well, I'll fix him. Now, let's see who made the mistake of bothering me. Egad! Ow! It's worse than I thought. It's my own son. Finding that voice for Prince Aaron was quite interesting. I remember thinking that I would do something that probably no other actor was going to be doing. I thought I would do a 12-year-old Peter O'Toole. And I said, oh, well, then I guess since I'm your sister, I have to be a miniature Catherine Hepburn. Because the joke is if you listen to their two voices, they sound like the same voice, just male, female. So everything that Robert did, I just tried to do the female part of it. I hope your team does well, Arusia. My, what fine sportsmanship. Thank you, Grubby. On behalf of the royal family, I'd like to wish your team all the best. Gee, I feel like I've won something already. With Tweeg, I stumbled on this crazy voice and, you know, it made everybody laugh and was sort of quasi-crazy demonic and goofy all at the same time. It's times like these I wish I had hands so I could cover my ears. No, I won't have bill collectors pounding on my door. Rich. No, I won't be living on a budget anymore. Rich. I won't have to make it or borrow it or make it. All I'm gonna do is to be rich. I guess it don't take brains to be rich. Oh, yeah. All I'm going to do is to be rich. And when I did The Wizard, I looked at the picture, and you couldn't see his teeth. So I thought, well, maybe he has no teeth. So that started Robert laughing when I did it, and they kept that one. And then when they were creating the character of the sorcerer, they came up with the idea that the sorcerer sounded a lot like the wizard because they were brothers. So I did the sorcerer without teeth. We had such a hard time keeping straight faces during those scenes. Hey, Stinky! Get out of my town and take your Stinky land with you! That's wizard land, Bucky! I was here first, and don't call me Bucky. I hate that nickname. Well, don't call me Stinky. Besides, I have all the customers, Bucky. Don't worry, I'll get them back. Stinky. I had a lot of fun doing The Wizard, but the thing with Tweeg was I got to work with Robert, and Robert and I are old pals from way back. We did a lot of theater together, and we used to make each other laugh a lot. I can't think of a project in my 42 years as an actor that I would say I had more fun at, and we cried. We were laughing so hard. In fact, sometimes they would take a break, and then we would resume recording, because unlike some cartoon series where you record your lines separately from everybody else, with Teddy, we tended to do the scenes with everybody in the studio recording at the same time. Portraying the character of LB, 
at times was a very painful experience, and I'll tell you why. LB was a beast of burden. He had to carry everything with his mouth, and he was called upon in the scripts to speak while he had this wooden bar inside of his mouth. So how come I'm doing all the pulling and you're doing all the sitting? Because I've got to rest my brains. I'm the thinking partner. In order to create that sound, I had to put something between my teeth. We tried a variety of things. The final solution, long story short, was the index finger of my right hand. And I kid you not, I still have indentations in my index finger. Our director said, Abby, you need to go into the isolation booth, and I want you to stand there and give me 60 seconds of Eleanor saying stroke. All the other actors are in the big room, and I'm in the little room. So I closed my eyes, and I stood there saying stroke till the end of time. And when I figured it was about a minute, I opened my eyes. The director had disappeared. He'd fallen off his chair because he was laughing so hard. And the reason he was laughing so hard was the reenactment of the final days of Sodom and Gomorrah that was going on in the big room. It was really funny because I have no idea how long they were doing whatever the hell they were doing, ripping their clothes off themselves and gyrating all over the place. I cannot remember how long it took me to get my composure back. Over the course of the 65 episodes, the character the character of Tweeg became much more fleshed out. In the storybooks, it was simply said that he had been kicked out of Ying for not being bad enough. But with the animated series, Ken and his team were able to explore who the bumbling wannabe villain really was. I always felt like Tweed was trying to belong and that he didn't belong, but he was trying to belong in his own way. He just wasn't competent enough or visionary enough to see that maybe there was another way of doing this rather than being pushy and being a bit of a bully. And also, I think the outsider nature of Tweed drove that character because there was nobody else like Tweed. He's literally the only one of his kind, the product of a troll mother and a grunge father. There is no other like him in the entire world, and he struggles with this. And he's the only character who is quite literally finished upon initial conception. Ken had Tweeg's name, look, demeanor, everything down on day one. Tweeg's the first puppet Ken tries building. His tower is the first set constructed. The animated series convinces me that Jack W. Tweeg was, secretly, or maybe not so secretly, Ken Forsey's favorite character. Even though this was a show geared towards children, those behind the scenes, with Ken's approval, used the medium of animation to teach life lessons masked as entertainment. The Ying Zhu stories, of course, portrayed Teddy and Grubby and Gimmick as enslaved. It showed that people will take advantage of other people. I remember those episodes and I thought, I hope what Ken is trying to do here by putting these episodes on is to show people that not everybody has your best interests at heart. It was right at the time when Nelson Mandela was released from prison, and I was so moved by his personal story that it just seemed logical to me to have this little, very sympathetic character who, through no fault of his own, winds up imprisoned. This song really was trying to reflect on what Nelson Mandela must have been thinking before he was released. I just was feeling something very sympathetic for him. So that character was able to reflect something that was happening in the real world without hitting it over the head. I know there is a place out there where I can feel the wind. Once you have known freedom, no bars can hold you. Freedom, freedom, I once tasted freedom, I was free to feel the sun, freedom's for everyone, freedom, freedom, I once had my freedom, nothing can imprison me. For I know what it is to be free Freedom doesn't only mean you can get up and leave Cartoons can affect people because they're relatable in some odd way, especially to kids, because kids are, you could say, not fully formed. They will get older and there will be more lines on their face and they will be more complicated. But as kids, they're simple. Drawings are generally simple, whether they move or not. So we can project ourselves into them easier. We'd like to give them personality so there's something to them. Freedom, freedom. I once had my freedom. Now nothing 
can imprison me. I know what it is to be free. To, to be, be free. free. We'll find a way out of here. I promise. The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin premiered in the fall of 1987 and made an immediate impact with children and adults alike. By the end of the 65th episode, Teddy had discovered the history of the Iliops and found his long lost father, Burl, who had been a victim of Queller's Black Box. The series ends on a cliffhanger, but unfortunately, it was not renewed for a second season. That's why I'll do everything I can to keep the crystals safe. Which won't be for long, Iliop. <laughs> I loved working at Atkinson Film Arts. I loved working on Teddy Ruxpin. When it was coming to an end, it was obviously very hard. We knew that the contract that we had was for 65 episodes exactly. I always did wonder what was going to happen next. The quality of Teddy Ruxpin appeals to a simpler, gentler, and more pure art form kind of animation that we don't see today. Everything about Teddy Ruxpin and the roles that we played has a quality of elegance to it. There are some projects I've done that I was really sad they were over. Some I was happy. Most of them are, well, on to the next thing. Everything's good. This one, I was really sad that it was gone. It was just a lovely experience. I would do something comparable again in a heartbeat. One of the things I think that made the series meaningful for kids who watched it was that Teddy talked right to them, and they could associate with him. It was a kind of an innocent, fun world. It required imagination to enter. Teddy represented them, the viewers, and they could associate with him. This world was so fantastical and fun. And the music was extraordinarily good. Just the opening theme warmed my heart just to hear. And I think that that meant a lot to kids who watched it. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's build a giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. Fly so high, come dream with me tonight. Come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's build a giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. The butterflies in springtime will lead us on our way. Exploding dandelions will brighten summer's day. And if our dream's a good one, and if our dream is right, then imagination can be real if we will dream to Come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight.
Let's meet a lovely princess and stand before a king. Let's dream a great adventure and let us live that magic dream. The orange leaves of autumn will crackle in the air. In winter, tiny snowflakes will sparkle everywhere. And if our dream's a good one, and if we see it through, then the wondrous dream we dream tonight someday just might come true.